Okay, so what we're going to do next is I'm going to talk for a little bit with Sarah, just about our experiences with table therapy, and then Catherine's going to tell you a lot more about it, the benefits. You know, we're talking about it with our children, but it's terrific for adults as well. Mm -hmm. So she'll let us know more, and then we'll have some questions and answers at the end. Okay. This is my family, who many of you know. Thank you for being here, family. <laughs> Um, so when our boys were six and seven, they were doing physical therapy twice a week already and doing a lot of speech and all kinds of different therapy. And our physical therapist had suggested hippotherapy as another really good activity, but also something that was just fun. It wasn't sitting in the studio all the time doing toe lifts. It was something that she thought they might really enjoy. So um, I, it, was a, it was an organization called Giant Steps for us, and you'll hear more. There are organizations all over the U.S. And this is one that was near us in Petaluma. So I called them and was delighted to hear they had room. And something that was great for us is that it was going to be $30 for each boy, which isn't nothing, but given the individualized attention and what the program was, the idea of that doing that, you know, once or, you know, between one and four times a month was a really fun, great opportunity for them. So um, we went the first time and they fell in love with it from the beginning. The way it worked for us is you would go in and, and it was just our two boys who would have a lesson. There's one physical therapist and then for each child there are two volunteers for each one. So they'd have someone walking on each side of the horse because they're big horses and then a number of other volunteers who are just there. So when they, when they started they'd arrive and they'd go in and, and there were a lot of different things they were working on but they'd start by going in and brushing the horse and taking care of their shoes and sort of building a bit of a relationship. And it wasn't like some lessons where you just go in and the horse is saddled and they hop on. They really had to play a big role in getting them ready and taking care of them, obviously with all the volunteers helping them through it. So then with, what they do is that they'd have a physical therapist in the middle of the ring. So this is Jack with two walkers and someone leading the horse. Sorry, there are three of them. And the physical therapist would sort of call out exercises. First, the, and first they would just walk around. And there are a number of things they're working on. They had to use their sort of loud, clear voices to talk to the kids. And for our guys with speech issues, that was a big thing. It gave them sort of a lot of self-esteem and confidence. Um, they would, they had to push their heels down in the, in the um, Stirrup. stirrups, which is really helpful because that's something that we need a lot, is a lot of stretching and a lot of core strengthening, sitting up straight. And then as they went around the ring, the physical therapists would have different exercises, like they'd have to reach all the way out to touch the horse's head and then reach back and they'd have to hold their hands up for a while while they're riding. So again, it's all the core strengthening of holding on to the horse and staying up straight. And then they did all kinds of little obstacles that they would go in and out of, and they'd have to talk to the horse and steer it. And then they, my guy's favorite was the basketball. They'd set up a basketball hoop so the boys would you know, take a ball and throw it through and the volunteers would help them. So it was a ton of great exercises, but really fun for them. And these volunteers, as you can imagine, were just amazing with them. They felt like total superstars. So um, again, the communication and confidence for Strengthening. I think the best part was that they just felt really special. It was something different that they had that they could, you know, we they could talk about it at school when all their kids are coming. You know, the other kids are coming back from different things on the weekend. This was something amazing to show them pictures, and it gave us an opportunity to talk a little bit about myotonic dystrophy. And this was a silver lining. <laughs> so, you know, I was talking about how this is something special that they could do. Sorry, it's because my family's here. <laughs> Uh, so our, we did it. We just did it for a couple of years. We did it every. I know I can't even look at that. We did it. We did it every week for you know close to a year, and then we started doing a little bit less. And we didn't stop for any reason except it was a little over an hour to get there. And as the boys got older, they had more homework at school, and they had other activities going on at school, and they also got tired. So you know during the day it got tough to get homework done, and the weekends we kind of like to just have a little time with the family. So it's something I would love to think we'd come back to. And again, it's just there's so many things that kids and all of us have to do, and this was just a huge bonus and something really fun to do. Um, so I'm really excited to share uh, our experience with uh, hypotherapy. Uh, Zoe started when she was about, um, I think, three. She's six and a half, so she's been doing it. She was the youngest one in her group. And a mom had told me about hypotherapy. I thought it was really interesting and in intriguing. First of all, hippo, I thought it was on a hippopotamus. <laughs> I thought it was really good for uh, hip flexors, but then I heard what it really was. And we were on a waiting list for two years. So it was really long. And hippotherapy, um, just like Jack and Ben, for Zoe, it was really great for self-esteem, loud, clear voice. You're commanding your horse. Th the same way we had two horse walkers, 
that you see here, and then there's somebody behind leading the horse, and then there was the, the physical therapist uh, just uh, shouting out exercises, so airplane arms, put your hands on your head, stretch all your, you know, so the warm-up exercises, and then they would go on trails, which was really good for balance, so they would leave the arena and then go and pick up toys and trees high up uh, from the horse, uh, open mailboxes, open little envelopes for fine motor skills, so that they even worked, you know, the fine motor skills activities, they did puzzles, fishing with a little, um, you know, these magnet fish that you can, you can <laughs> grab, and so just work a lot of that. Um, they even, for speech therapy, it was interesting because, you know, the, uh, she has problems with the B's, the M's, and the P's, all the bilabial sounds, so they would ask me what, what would you like us to work on, you know, we're on the horse, but let's do other stuff and reinforce what she's working on at school. So that was a great thing. They had these big uh, dice that you would throw and count math and do numbers. I mean, it was just amazing. And now she goes to another ranch where they show her Star Wars and, sci and sight words, her first one. She's in first grade, so she has to go around and read those words. So they're really helpful for even just school. It's, it's, it's a bridge to, you know, to bring everything together. So that's, that's been really interesting. Um, so core strengthening is important. I was kind of worried when they decided to trot. I was worried because she has neck pain. And I was thinking the trotting would be, but she loves it. That's like <laughs> probably her favorite. So, and I saw the smile on her face. I was like, okay, no worries. Uh, so that, that's really, um, really nice. Um, um, Zoe also rode backwards, so facing the tail. And that's really good for your vestibular. I'm sure you're gonna talk about it. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> for your balance and just, you know, the horse is going that way and you're facing that way, it's kind of different. So I think it connects probably everything in your brain and for balance and vestibular system. Uh, so that's really um, good. Um, she is, so she never used a saddle, which is really good for the hips and hip flexors, you know, really opens up your legs. Um, and I also like to talk about the social emotional component because even though it's on a horse and you think she's alone on that horse, she has to talk to the sidewalkers. She has to mm -hmm. remember their names, greetings, thank yous, you know, because the social component is important for our kids, and that's an added plus on the horse. Um, I think uh, there's also a magical connection between the horses and the, and the kids. There's something that you can't really describe. What I also think is amazing is it's outdoors. And, you know, as you were saying, we're so used to crowded waiting rooms and they're, you know, they're indoors and, you know, this is magical. You see trees and, and we live in California, so we're very lucky for the weather. <laughs> so for moms, it's also a nice way to, or dads, a nice way to interact with other families while we're waiting. And there's really that sense of community. I think it's, it's really amazing. You know, I've seen, I've seen kids now for three years, they grow, they're, they're changing and, you know, there's like, it's like a family. So I think that was really, really nice. Um, the routine is important. Our kids need that, and it's it's so precise. You have to be there at the exact time. You can't be late. The horse is not waiting. You know. So, <laughs> um, also fine motors. She has to put on her helmet, clip it, unclip it, clip it again, and put it on her little hook. So yeah. all that is also good. And other activities for fine motor, they would use uh, clothes pins, and then she has to pin them on the on the mane of the horse. Um, so they they just find really interesting things to do. Um, and then um, speech therapy, I talked about it. And so I fought insurance, so you have to be strong in this world. And insurance companies, it was $90 for a session of 30 minutes, so it's very expensive. And when I called the insurance, they said, we don't insure anything with a horse, involving a horse. And I said, well, it's a certified physical therapist that as opposed to using a ball, uses a horse. So can you give me a little bit of, you know? And so they did, they did agree. They said, okay, so they gave us $25 per session. Uh, they covered that part. So, you know, it's, it, it's always helpful. And um, after, uh, I guess, so Zoe also, what she really loves is to give treats to the horses, apples and carrots at the end. It's like she's in command. It's good for self-esteem, as we said. And, um, and then she has her horse show at the end of the year. It's like 10 minutes on the horse. She gets to trot around and do a few things. And it's so, you know, all her friends see her trophies, her little trophies with her name engraved and she just loves it, so she might not be a ballet dancer or a soccer player, but hey, this is, I think this is her thing. <laughs> so thank you for, uh, for listening and coming today. Yeah. Okay.
That's great, but we'll do everything that Sarah and Erica have told you. I experience every time I have a, a hypotherapy session. I just want to clarify something. So uh, you talked about hypotherapy and then graduating to therapeutic writing. Right? Yeah, or you so did that. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So what is the difference between hypotherapy and therapeutic writing? It looks the same. You go there. There's a horse. There's somebody on it. There's sidewalkers and there's a leader. Hypotherapy is a physical therapy or an occupational therapy or a speech therapy session where we just happen to use the horse, as you said, instead of a ball or instead of something else. So the horse allows us to expand what we're doing and to make it really functional. But it's really a therapy session. It's done by a registered or licensed therapist. We just happen to use the horse. Therapeutic riding, on the other hand, is a sport. It's a sport in which um, you have a little bit of help to help with the challenges you have. So as you said, the children learn how to ride and then they go to horse shows. I mean, it's really a sport like any other sport you would start. Um, just way more fun. <laughs> but um, So that's the difference. It looks the same, from, from the, but the intention of the session is different. Therapeutic riding tends to be less expensive than physical yeah. therapy because Stop physical price. therapy is done by a therapist and so it's less expensive. A quick note on the insurance. Uh, I, am, I have my own practice and I um, submit my claims to insurance. In Virginia, there, no insurance will reimburse physical therapy. And, and I'm, it's going to change in a minute what I say. Even if you beg for it, they just don't want it. Um, so it's very state specific. In Texas, I was told that Medicaid reimburses physical, um, hypotherapy. You know, so every state is a little bit different. However, recently, um, three months ago, TRICARE decided to start reimbursing hypotherapy in certain conditions, only with a diagnosis of cerebral palsy or um, uh, MS, and only if the therapist has the proper training and it's in a center that's, been, that's part of the national organization, and I'll go into details with that. So that's a new thing that started, which is, a good, which is good news. If a federal agency is starting to consider hypotherapy, I think in the future, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of hope for that. All right, so I will um, show you a video of the movement of the horse and the movement of a person walking, and I will talk at the same time so that you can get a feel for how we use the horse in uh, hypotherapy. So this is the person working, and you can see there's a dot on their pelvis, a dot on the top of the pelvis, and a dot on the thigh, and look at how the dots move as the person walks. And you can go ahead, thank you. So you see there's a little bit of turning. You can see the dots on the back too, right? It's going pretty fast. Okay, and now from the back, look at how the dots move in relation to each other. See, one side gets a little bit shorter, one side gets a little bit longer, right? And so as physical therapists, we are always very um, focused or obsessed with the pelvis because the pelvis is really the base on which you stand or on which you sit. And so with the horse, you have an in to the pelvis. The horse's back touches the pelvis. So if you can modify the horse's movement, you can pretty much get everything to happen on top of that. And you were talking about how it helps speech. You all know that speech has a comment. You need to be able to conceive what you want to say. There's a muscle component in speech, but the breath is also a big component in speech, right? And if your posture is not correct, it's hard to get a deep breath and to get enough power to speak. So if with the horse you're able to modify what the pelvis does to improve the posture, then speech will improve. Um, and there's also the, uh, the part of if you say go and you can get a thousand pound animal to move and do what you want, you discover the power of speech. <laughs> a lot of the kids who never spoke start speaking with me and I'm not a speech therapist because they learn very quickly. You just ask the horse to stop and they want the horse to go so badly that they will say whatever to get the <laughs> horse going. And they get instant reward. So now you see the person next to the horse and just notice how their legs move the same way. If you just take two of the horse's legs, do you feel how it's the same <laughs> length in wow. the same way? It's very similar, right? It's not exactly the same, but it's very close, right? And look at the, st the step length. Um, that horse, it, look at the handler, definitely has the same stem plank as the horse. So this is something that we can really use. 
So now let's see how the, horse of the, the movement of the horse is transmitted to the rider. And look at the amount of movement. You get the horse is just walking. We're not talking canter here, right? It is just a simple walk. During a half hour session, the horse steps about 3,000 times. So imagine if you went to a therapy session where the therapist got your pelvis in their hands and moved it 3,000 times <laughs> in a half hour. It would be very intensive, right? Mm -hmm. And what's very interesting about the horse too is that um, not, no two steps of the horse are exactly the same, right? So there's a lot of variations in it. So the, the rider gets a lot of input, but it's not repetitive input. It's repetitive, but varied at the same time. Now, so this is just the basing going straight, and you see already just a straight walk. There's a lot to do. it. For some of the children I work with who have huge challenges, Sometimes, for the first three months, we just do a straight walk. That's all they can deal with, and they already get a lot from that. Now, with myotonic dystrophy, the issue of fatigue and energy conservation comes in, right? So we can definitely modify what the horse does and how long we do it to accommodate for the child's endurance. Uh, and it's a very important thing that we consider. The type of movement we do, there's three basic movements. There's the forward and the back, the flexion extension, right, that you can see there. We turn, that's the other type of movement we do. And then we have the side bending. Every movement we do is a combination of those three in one way or the other. So on the horse, look at the forward and back movement here. Do you see how much the pelvis is moving forward and back? So in a plain straight walk with that particular horse, you get a lot of forward and back movement. Now, different horses have different movements the same way we have different movements. So I have four horses. One of them gives a lot of lateral movement. One of them gives a lot of forward and back. And that's more of the anterior posterior, which is forward and back movement. But I can also modify the position of the rider or the position of the horse to create the movement I want anywhere. As you were saying, sometimes you sit backwards. Sometimes my kids lie on the horse. Sometimes they're on, the, on all fours on the horse. So here. They're using a turn, and look at what happens to the rider when they're turning. So the horse is turning to the right. The centrifugal force each step is bringing them out a little bit. So if I wanted to teach that rider how to lengthen their left side, I would get the horse to turn right, and at each step, the horse is gonna ask the rider to lengthen the left side. Um, if I wanted to do to increase the rotation, one of the things you can do is ask the horse to go sideways, and then the pelvis of the rider rotates more, or ask the horse to go backwards, and look how it turns the rider's pelvis. So you can modify the rider's position, you can modify the exercises they do, and you can modify what the horse does. So you really have a huge variety of possibilities on the horse. And that's just the part on the horse, and you talked about everything that can be done before. So all these stretchings that you would do in the gym don't look like stretching at all. They look like getting the horse ready. Well, to put the saddle on the horse, get what? guess what? You really have to get tall and you really have to stretch. To bring your stirrup up, the same thing. To brush, you can brush with one hand, you can brush with the other hand. So all through the sessions, there's all kinds of possibilities. The problem we have with hypotherapy is that it's very hard to do research. Just because a lot of the people, if you take a group even of, of 20 kids with the same diagnosis, everybody's a little bit different. It's hard to have an exact, uh, the right number of people with the same issues, right? But there's quite a bit of research. And what the research shows is the things that show up the most is posture improvement and balance improvement. That's, every research shows that. And as you, as you said, physical, um, there's three different things that are um, improved with hypotherapy. There's the physical aspect that I just talked to you about, typically increased core strength. One interesting thing, um, it tends to decrease the energy expenditure. So the kids who, when they have tested the energy used for kids to walk, and then they do hypotherapy sessions and then they retest, the kids use less energy to walk after a hypotherapy session, which is an important part, um, very important. 
increased vital lung capacity has been found too. So the breathing increases. I don't know if it's due to the posture that improve it. Uh, it. It didn't say that, but that was one of the things that um, hypotherapy <coughs> is good for. One study that was interesting is that now they're trying to make simulators so that you can do the movement of the horse in the room, which is so sad. But so, <laughs> so, so they show that the, the physical component are almost the same if you have a simulator or if you're outside, the actual movement part is the same. But what is different is that when you are on a horse, you have less fatigue and people reported improvement in quality of life, which they did not report when they were on the simulator inside. <laughs> so I like that one very much. Um, there are several so studies that shows that there's a change in just one session of hypotherapy. There are studies that shows that uh, there's long-term change. One of the issues is that a lot of the studies are on cere cerebral palsy and multiple sclerosis, so that's why the insurances now are decided to reimburse it, so we do need more research in a, a bigger variety. Um, as far, so we have the physical component, we have the social-emotional component that's very important too. The horse gives the kids a non-verbal, non-judgmental, way of communication and that is so important as you said when you go to so many therapists and so many doctors and you leave with the list of what your child cannot do with a horse there's not a there's no cannot do in that situation it's it's a we make sure the environment is such that learning becomes irresistible. We don't teach anything, we just make learning irresistible. And the volunteers are part of it, those volunteers are just kind of fantastic. It really is a team of the volunteers, the horse and the therapist. If you take one of the elements out, or if one of the elements doesn't want to be there, it doesn't work the same way. Um, the horses have to be trained, not every horse can do that, not every therapist can do that. Uh, you really have to have a cohesive team where, the, as you say, the kid is the center. He's the reason to be. Everybody's happy to see the kid come. I mean, it's a, my volunteers come because it's a therapy for them. They just love to come and be with the kids and be with your kids and just really enjoy it. Um, so that's a big part of it. Okay, let me think. And as you said, um, it's used more and more now to help children who have either learning disabilities or something that prevents them from learning or having trouble in school. Just uh, when you walk in an indoor ring, we have letters that are the same for everybody in every indoor ring. And so you can just start by saying, you know, go to A and then turn to F and then, so the, it's in there. You have to know your letters in, or you can use your letters to do that. Mm -hmm. um, let me see if there's anything. Oh, another thing that the studies show is that there's a consistent, they've shown that there's a release of endorphin after the hypotherapy session which then helps with pain relief. Some of the people I work with, one of the adults is a um, wounded warrior with PTSD and she has a lot of pain. And what, her, what it does to her is that she's pain free for several days after that and then she needs to come back. So that's another piece of it where you, you might be able to then decrease your pain medication because you get that endorphin. Um, I think that's all I wanted to say. Yes, I wanted to clarify it's not hippopotami, it's ponies and horses. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> asks. Um, and the trot, oh yeah, and just one more thing about the safety of it all. So you're right, it's scary to see your child on a horse and they decide to trot. It's very scary. <laughs> the reason why we have two sidewalkers and a leader is for maximum safety. And we have emergency protocols that we rehearse. First, do no harm is really the big deal. So one of the things you can look for, if you look for a center for your children, there is a national organization that's called PATH International, P-A-T-H. It's a professional association of therapeutic horsemanship. They, um, have national standards of safety for their centers. So if you go to a center that is PATH International certified, you know that the people are trained, the volunteers are trained, my volunteers are trained for therapeutic writing, and then I do a specific hypotherapy training for them too, uh, because we don't want to take any chances. And for the therapist, the national organization, I think you have it in your notes, is the American Hypotherapy Association. So as you look for centers, 
just look for that to, have, to make sure that you have the safety standards that are important. All right. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. At this point, we'd love to take any questions that you might have. Thank you for that. It's so sure. nice to have. Does anyone have questions? <laughs> I have a question about um, saddles, if you could talk a little bit oh, about saddles. Very good question. Thank you. Because I know I forgot to say some things, but I hate to just keep on talking. Um, yes, so you've seen some pictures. I think some pictures your children had saddles and some guys did. You said you didn't. Well, now with therapeutic riding, uh, at another ranch, she's on a saddle. But at Xenophon, she's not on a saddle. So she does both. All right. And so um, they both have... Uh, Pluses and minuses, we use them in certain time, and I never judge anything. Everything is good sometimes or bad sometimes, but um, we, I use um, mainly uh, bareback pads, which are just, it's just a, a pad that you put on the horse uh, that doesn't have any stirrups. So the child has to work with, with their balance on that. That really challenges your balance, but it also allows you to do all kinds of positions. So sitting and facing the front of the horse is one, Sitting facing the back of the horse, the th kids think it's so silly to go backwards, and then you have the tail, and then of course the horse did all kinds of, of you know things, and we could always <laughs> laugh about that. Um, then we also have the sideways sitting, when both legs are on the same side, and the kids are sitting sideways, which is quite challenging too, um, which is great when you have somebody who has a, a different, who uses the right side and the left side differently that really challenges the left to right movement and the forward and back, so it's very great. But then sometimes a saddle is what you want. So if you're thinking, uh, I forgot to tell about, you talked about the age. You can do physical therapy from the age of two, um, I'm sorry, hypotherapy from the age of two, uh, and you can only start therapeutic riding when you're five. So a lot of the little ones I have are below the age of five and are hoping to later use that as a sport, do uh, therapeutic riding when they're five. So I have one right now who started with me when she was two and she's gonna be five in November, she can't wait. Mm -hmm. And um, so what we've done for the last season, I've transitioned into therapeutic riding. I'm also a therapeutic riding instructor. So I'm, I'm trained to do both. Um, so in the last session, we've done a hybrid between hypotherapy and we started to introduce the saddle and introduce the stirrups. And in her case, she has, her leg muscles are not strong, very strong, and so when she stands, she tends to stand with her legs very straight. You know, she locks her knee to stand up. Um, so I have used the stirrups then as a way to teach her to stand up without locking her knees. Because if you're in the stirrups and you lock your knees, you find yourself back on your saddle. So you have to find, how do I bring myself over my stirrups while the horse is moving? Uh, without locking my knee. So the saddle was what she needed. Mm -hmm. So sometimes saddles are what you want. They also offer a little bit more. They increase your support and your stability, but they decrease the amount of movement you get. So we play with all that. Mm -hmm. That's right. The idea is to support you, support the rider so that they can do what they need to do. So the idea of therapeutic riding, it's riding with the support you need to, to, to be able to ride, whatever that means, uh, you, you know, how much you need. The, the, the only concern with the saddle that we all have when we do that is that you always want to make sure that the rider is not attached to the horse in any way. Because you need to be able to get off quickly if you need to. So that's always a big challenge, otherwise it would be easy to just kind of tie everybody on them or whatever. But you have to do support that, is, that you can undo very quickly. Very good. Any other question? Uh huh. When you have children that are wearing braces of any nature, do they wear those when they are doing this therapy with you? Yeah. When my daughter goes to regular physical therapy, we have her wear more body and her ankle brace, mm -hmm. um, but she can wear the shirts up um, because it's the safest for her. Mm -hmm. um, I would be too. Yeah. Yes. And so, yeah. But she's got the stirrup, and so it's teaching her because that's where she's weak at as well. And, mm -hmm. and it's forcing her to stand without locking the legs. Um, but 
But I'm not sure about the sure step because when she's got to do different motions, I feel like she can't really move her, her foot in the proper way. Okay, and that's a fabulous question. And it's really, it really depends on the child and what you, your goal and your intention is. Um, if it would be interesting, I think, if she were coming to see me, I think the way I would think about it is that how can I develop her ankle strength through physical therapy, uh, through hypotherapy? So it may be that at first we need the sure step, but little by little we can change or we can... The, having the cowboy boot would be great because it's a little bit, it gives you a little bit of support, right? They're pretty, they're pretty stiff and sturdy. They're like a cool brace in some ways. They're not as supportive as the AFO would be, but they're kind of an in-between. So if she's sitting, if she's got a stirrup, she doesn't have that much weight on her ankles because a lot of it is on the sits bones, right? So that would be a great way to start to learn how to use your ankles in a safe manner. So it really depends on the child. And so most of my kids, I, since we don't have stirrups and they're sitting, it doesn't make any sense to have the ankle brace on. Um, so most of them, I tell them just take the braces off unless we have to go up on the ramp and climb up. It, it really depends on what you want to do first. Uh, you might also have it all the way up to the horse and then take them off when you're on the horse. That's another possibility. Because sometimes climbing up to the ramp, she would need it, or right? Yes, yes, they do the ramp first. You know, it's, all a, it's a whole process. Yeah, it is a whole process. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> the part on the horse is not that much, actually. Yes, and yeah. I will tell you, she's five, and she falls asleep when we get in the car on the way home. But she falls <laughs> I, I had to cancel because of a thunderstorm the other day and I just texted a mom and said we need to cancel and she texted me right back she said oh I told Kelly we were gonna cancel she's crying <laughs> and they do and every day they ask little ones who can barely talk they know how to say Miss Catherine Miss Catherine and horsey that's what they say and I have a little one Monday is our writing day and when mom says Monday she says horsey so you know <laughs> Um, they really love it, that's true, they really do. And I have to say, the horses that we use in hypotherapy are really, really special horses. They're not, not every horse can do it. It's quite stressful. Uh, horses are herd animals and they like to, f the flight is what they do. And in this, you've seen, they're surrounded by humans, right? They have nowhere to go. So the horse has to really trust the people he's with, and, and it's pretty, but once they get into the game, um, you said magical, it's, it's, it's beyond magical. Uh, the pony I've had for nine years, who's been doing that with me for nine years, um, just, I, rem I was reminded on Tuesday, I have a little guy who's very sensitive, um, ve very sensory, and so everything has to be just right, otherwise it's really hard for him to deal with it. And um, for some reason on Tuesday, my pony was going so slow, I just couldn't stand it. He was just doing like one step after the other. And so I asked him to go forward a little bit. And the moment I did, the little guy tensed up. And so I thought, oh. And I just let him go back to where he, he, he had been getting clues from his rider, which he does all the time. He gets cues from the riders all the time. And he knew that was the speed he was comfortable with that day. The moment he went get back to that speed, the little guy relaxed and started singing again. So <laughs> horses, I mean, it's, horses are, are, they are very aware of movements, of other people's movements, because they're herd animals. When the lion comes, they can't talk to each other. Uh, they don't use language when they're stressed. They don't use language when they're hurting. So you, can, you cannot tell when a horse hurts either. But so they're very, very attuned to people's movements. And so you can, once you know how to do that, you can use them as a way to tell you what the kid need, what the kids need. So if the kids cannot talk, the rider cannot talk, I can see, watch my horse and know whether we need to stop or whether we need to go faster or whether we need to go. They're fantastic for that. So you really have like a, a the horse is a big part of the team, definitely. I actually have a question, Catherine. Yeah. What, what Alma was saying is that she's always ridden for a long time, and we talked a lot about children and horses. That's right. But for it's adults. equally beneficial to adults, right? I know at That's our right. kids' center there were adults as well, That's but maybe right. you could talk about. Hopefully, you don't have to do the little clothespins on the tree. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're but it's it's equally no, that's beneficial right. for that's right age, for adults. Right? We definitely don't do the clothespin on the trees. But yes, um, there is a person I work with. She is 73 years old and just had a stroke last year, uh, and she she didn't know how to use her left side anymore. 
And being on the horse, you don't have the option of only using one side. So just sitting on the horse, the horse brings you left and right and left and right at every step. And she's now able to feel her left side. She's able to bring her leg, her hands to the middle and all that. And there's the story of a lady who started, I for, always forget her name, but she started riding when she was in her 70s and she was an Olympic gold medalist in dressage when she was 78 years old. So it's never too late <laughs> to do that. And it benefits adults as much as it benefits kids. Uh, and of course, it's at a different level. As you said, it's not a game thing. Uh, you can learn how to ride um, as an adult. What people generally find is pain relief, normalizing of the muscle tone. That's always fascinated me. If you have low tone, the tone gets higher. If you have high tone, the, the tone gets lower. So it normalizes it. And just a sense of well-being. And uh, one of my uh, rider always says, I don't understand. After I've been here, I'm just happy for three days. <laughs> and I feel the same way. That's why I do hypotherapy two days a week. It, keeps me up until Saturday, Sunday, and then I'm start, very ready to start again. <laughs> and is there Sorry. also a, an added component about the warmth of the horse? That's because, it. Thank you. You know, when you're on a ball, it's plastic, it's cold, and on a horse, it's... That's right. The warmth of the horse is really helpful for the kids, too, and I think it's part, and for the riders, it's part of why the muscles relax and everything calms down, too. And that's one thing where, with the saddle, you don't feel the warmth of the horse. With the bareback pad, you do. So that's one of the things you can do. The other thing I didn't mention for the vestibular system, the, what, what's different with the horse and anything else you do in the, in the gym is that you have a displacement in space, right? When you're on a machine or on a treadmill or on a, you do a lot of movement, but you don't move in space, right? So it's uh, the difference of walking on a treadmill or actual walking, the difference is that you have to move in space and you get that in the horse so you get all the movements plus the spatial displacement which makes a big difference for your vestibular system you cannot recreate that really in the uh, in the gym except maybe for riding a bike that's the only thing that would be closer to having that yeah yeah on the horse also it was amazing like zoe did uh, uh, crunches on the back uh -huh. So there's no saddle, of course, and she's on the horse and she's doing crunches <laughs> for her abs, and I was like, whoa. <laughs> she's, she's riding on the horse like a sack of potato. Uh -huh. So and then yep. she has to do this dolphin thing with her her head and bring it up. And then they had a little girl at the ranch who had had a stroke, and she they had her stand up on the horse. So she's standing uh, on the horse, and the horse is going around, and just the same thing to you know for her to reuse that that side of her body, but. Yeah, I mean, it's, you can really use a horse in so many ways, it's amazing. <laughs> and uh, when I looked at the research, I tried to look at all the people who were, all the subjects in the research, and I only found one who had myotonic dystrophy. <laughs> and so I want to show you the results of, what, of that one. What they found is that the, that person had low tone to start with, and the tone stabilized, and he, would, he, or she, he was able to, uh, go up and down stairs much more easily after the session. That was his goal, to be able to go up and down stairs more easily. And then he was able to stabilize his trunk and improve his balance as well. Uh, wow. There aren't a lot of studies on myotonic dystrophy, but I found one, so I was Next very year. excited about Next it. I was year. very Next excited. <laughs> there, cool. Any other questions? Well, Sarah, do um, Right, so, up. well, we know, thank you, first of all, for coming. We know 15 minutes is not long enough, and we could be talking about it for ever, but we want to let you know that there are different modalities to continue this conversation. Uh, you can go on the MDF uh, website. Uh, there's the MDF Caregivers Group on Facebook. Also, the MDF DM1, that's for adults uh, with DM1. Uh, there's also a group on Facebook, and you'll find information also. Uh, there's now something new, it's the monthly caregiver virtual support group meeting, and that's on the phone. We have three uh, volunteers who, um, we have Marty Benner from Florida, Regina Thompson from Tennessee, and Cecilia Stern from San Jose, and they will be on, on call once a month uh, to answer questions. Um, and then don't forget there are resources for, for this session also on, on the MDF website. I think uh, everybody will be able to listen. I don't think it's videoed, but it's, it will be on the, on the website. Excellent. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you.